So, in verse 5, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I've just been reading or just finished a book by a woman called Jacqueline Yallop. It's not a Christian book. Uh, it's called Into the Dark, What Darkness Is and Why It Matters. Now, I thought that it'd be very easy to say what darkness is. And I'm tempted to ask you, uh, but maybe I shouldn't, because uh, this book kind of got me thinking a lot about what darkness actually is. Why are people scared of the dark? Uh, what different forms? It is darkness the opposite of light? Because I thought it was. I would have said that it was. Uh, but Isaac Newton says it's not, so I'm not going to argue with uh, Isaac Newton. And Yallop says this, as these reactions suggest, darkness is more than a case of not seeing. So what is it? A feeling, an experience, a change of state? Biological explanation of the dark is not even the beginning. And to be honest, what we're looking at is not so much uh, physical darkness, the kind of darkness that we will get in a week's time when the clocks go, do they go forward or back? I can't remember. Back, they go back. So it'll be darker at night and lighter in the morning. Is that correct? Okay, good, I got it. Um, we're not talking about the kind of darkness at night. Not really. What we're talking about is something more ethereal, more emotional. So at the end, we're going to sing a song called Great is the Darkness that Covers the Earth. And that's not looking at the, the night moving. As you know, you've got one of these global clocks that does that. Darkness is it's most definitely a feeling, and it can be for different reasons. So, for example, you can get to a stage where you've just watched enough of the news and you just think, enough, I can't cope with any more. Um, I don't know, I mean, you, I didn't want to see footage of people being shot in Moscow this week. I just didn't want to see it. And I didn't want to read yet another analysis of uh, what kind of cancer Princess Kate may have. Uh, I just feel really sorry for her, but I don't need to know the details. And I don't want to be absorbed in, in darkness. Um, Conrad's book, Heart of Darkness, was made into the film Apocalypse Now, and I love, absolutely love that film. Uh, but it's a clip. I, I would love to have shown you some clips from it, but first of all, they're not appropriate for church. Uh, and also, you really need to see the whole film, but I regard it as an absolutely brilliant film. But one of the things that happens, which would probably make you not want to go to it, is when you, you come out at the end, you're just overwhelmed by this sense of darkness. It really is <clears throat> very dark. And in our world, we can look at things and we can see darkness. So there's a, a wonderful, I, I was going to show this clip and then decided not to. Uh, you can look it up on YouTube. It's a uh, uh, Robin Williams in the film Good Morning Vietnam, which is a film I absolutely loved, but it has one particular time where Williams, Robin Williams as a DJ introduces Louis Armstrong singing, I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue and trees of green and, and so on, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. And, and the, but the, that's the song, but the imagery is of a village being blown up. The imagery, this is why I couldn't show it to you, the imagery is a group of young Vietnamese boys being taken out and, and, and shot by the Vietnamese police, or of American soldiers being blown up. And there's one particular part of that imagery when talking about a wonderful world, and there's a bloodied sandal there. And, I mean, it's brilliant. The juxtaposition is brilliant. And even the whole film is brilliant in that regard because... What it does is it takes comedy, and Robin Williams is a comedy genius, or was a comedy genius, and it marries it to the reality of people suffering and dying and everything else. And there's a darkness. There's a darkness in the world. There's a darkness in Newcastle, and it's not any more from coal dust. So if we could, we could put up on the screen, if we knew this, Every single home right now in Newcastle where there's domestic violence or where there's abuse. Every single home where there are people who are seriously ill, who've just been told, like Princess Kate, that uh, they have got cancer. Every single home where there are abusive and manipulative 
relationships and lies and everything else. To say to our children, now you want to protect children from that, but to say to our children and to our young people, the world is full of light and it should be and you shouldn't feel sorrow and anything like that is, is incredibly foolish. So this darkness that exists in the world, now here's, the, here's something, racism isn't new. You know, racism didn't come into existence when the Scots came to Australia. Just wanted to let you know that, okay? Um, racism, violence, slavery. You know, it's, it's quite extraordinary that we're so illiterate historically that we think slavery was invented by the British Empire. There has never been an empire in the world that did not have slavery. It's extraordinary to know that. So, as we think about that, we think the world that Jesus came into, it was a world in which the um, Israel, Gaza, Gaza existed then. It wasn't free. It was occupied by the Romans. And there was often mass slaughter. There was terrorism. At least one, if not two, of Jesus' disciples were considered to be terrorists. You know, there was oppression how women suffered within that context. There was plague. At one point in the second century, almost a third of the Roman Empire was wiped out by plague. I mean, it, it was, there was extraordinary darkness in lots of ways. There was a great deal of religious confusion. So, uh, Liz is going to come up and read uh, John 12, 35 to 36, because the theme of light and darkness go through the whole of this gospel, and don't worry, we're not going to mention every single verse, but I just want to give you some idea of the themes. So, the next reading is John chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. Then Jesus told them, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. So here's the key thing. In, 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 in science, darkness and light are not opposites in this that light exists, darkness is the absence of light. And you, that may seem a kind of very fine point, but you'll see there's a, there's, there's a real, it's a really important thing. Newton was the first one to really teach this, that darkness is an absence of light. But there's also something more. Hundreds of years before Newton, John, the Gospel of John was teaching us that darkness also stands for evil. And that's the point. That's the point when you say heart of darkness. It is a, a, a concept of evil. Now, if you were a very strict atheist, a consistent atheist, and thankfully not many people are, and I mean that, I mean there are, there are many people who are atheists who are fine people in many ways, but I don't think they're consistent, but a consistent atheist would have to do what Richard Dawkins does where he says the universe has all the properties that you would expect if there were no good, no evil. There's nothing. There's, no, there's nothing moral. It's just material. But I would suggest that you have to be particularly um, emotionally and intellectually stinted when I say that, if, if, you, if you don't accept the existence of evil. And so Jesus says that he was come into the world, the light shines in the darkness. He's come to bring light in that darkness. In Genesis 1 verse 2, we're told darkness was over the surface of the deep. Then God said, let there be light. What's happening here in John 1, which reflects Genesis 1, is as that happened physically, this is Jesus coming into the world and God saying, right, enough. We've had enough of the darkness, now there's light. And I, I would apply that in lots of ways, by the way, in terms of the context and the culture in which we live. Um, we say about darkness, I, I mentioned before, I often bump into people around here who are shouting and yelling and swearing like mad and just, you know, 
off their heads in different ways, maybe with drugs, maybe with alcohol, I don't know. But there's something very dark and ugly about it. Or you see two people fighting in the street. There's something very dark and, and ugly about it. And it's a sense overall of a darkness and a confusion, and I would say a spiritual darkness. Newcastle is a wonderful city, and I'm not just saying that. Uh, one of the things that it's a wonderful city is because you get quite a lot of sunshine. And I say this coming from a place where we considered 180 days with a bit of sun as being just wonderful. Uh, but you get quite a lot of sunshine. But I'll tell you this, I think Newcastle would be quite a miserable place if it had Scottish weather. Sorry, just, you know, if it was gray and miserable. You, you should try being in Scotland in February. I used to get up and go to school at nine in the morning and it was dark. I'd come home at three and it was dark. And not even just the kind of dark dark, it's the kind of dark that you get wind and rain and okay, you get rain, you, it chucks it down. But with us, it was like horizontal rain or continual drizzle. And it's just gloom. And actually, there was this, this a recognized mental illness or psychological condition, sad, seasonally acquired something, I don't know, deficiency or, or whatever. I, 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 you cannot, I cannot believe that you have it here. Uh, do you, you do have it here. Okay. So, but you have a different reason to be sad, don't you? Seasonal affective disorder, that's the one. Okay. Well, um, I, I don't understand how you can have a seasonal affective disorder when you've got the ocean and the pools and the sun, but obviously you do. So it's all relative. But I think we need light, don't we? And what's being said here is that John the Baptist was not the light, Buddha was not the light, Confucius is not the light, Muhammad is not the light. In general, I don't think that religion brings light. And can I also say this? I think some of you have had bad experiences of Christianity, and I would like to suggest to you that an awful lot of Christianity doesn't bring light either. In fact, that makes it almost even worse, where you get religious people who are supposed to be really, uh, you know, good people. They're moral. They're holy. They're virtuous. And then you see how they behave or how they speak. And you went, well, hang on, there's a disconnect here. And there often is a disconnect. Religion can be used in darkness as well. In fact, I would say some of the deepest darkness is religious darkness. Okay, so now we've got this witness. We've got this thing where it said light came in into the darkness. Um, and we read verses 6 to 8, and I'm going to ask Liz again. I'm making her work. John 3, 27 to 30. So John 3, 27 to 30. To this John replied, A person can only receive what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. John the Baptist, you must become greater, I must become less. This morning in the church here, we're looking at how, we were looking partly at how not to understand Scripture and how not to use the Bible. Um, uh, the worst example, and this is a true example, I, wouldn't, I would have said this was made up, but I actually saw the advert. So this is a true example. It was for something called a Christian slimming club, which I find unbelievable. Um, but you get Christian everything. So I, I don't know why you just don't go to a slimming club. Why do you need a Christian? You know, would we have a Christian gym, you know, or something? Uh, those of you who go to curves, what would you call it? I don't know, holy curves or something. Um, I, I mean, sometimes Christians can be a bit daft and do stuff like this. Well, there was a Christian slimming club. You know what their motto was, their text? He must increase, I must decrease. <laughs> I was thinking, that's just absolutely appalling. <laughs> it's just... You know, you just think, oh, goodness me, come on, are you serious? But they were. They thought this was very appropriate. What John is saying in that is very simple. He's saying, if you see me as the preacher or the teacher or whatever, and I'm lifting up myself, that's entirely wrong. Because he's a witness to the light. He himself is not the light. 
John 5.35 says this, John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. He gave light for a while, but it was a lamp. It was a reflection. It wasn't the light. If you have an electric bulb, it's we had a, uh, I didn't know this today on our dining table, uh, after we, we had some guests around and after we finished and tidying up, I went to blow out the candles and they wouldn't blow out. Well, that's because they were electric. Uh, I didn't know they were. They were very good, very effective. And then I find there's a switch at the bottom, you put them out. But even electric candles will go out because they are not the light. They need energy. They need something to come in. And again, one of the major difficulties you will find in the Christian church is Christians, and especially people like me who are leaders in the church with massive egos, who it, it suddenly becomes all about them. Uh, there's a very famous televangelist called Benny Hinn, and a friend of mine uh, went to visit him in, uh, went to visit his, his house, actually, in America. And this man is now an elder in the church, so I don't think he's lying. I still find it extraordinary. He said above the gate of his gated mansion, with its swimming pools and private helicopter pad and all the money and everything else made out of preaching, was a sign that said, to the glory of God and Benny Hinn. And you think, wow, seriously? Now, most of us wouldn't be that crass. But one of the things that so often goes wrong in the church is it becomes all about us. You know, so I will be honest with you. I'd love to see this church absolutely packed. And then if I went to a conference and said, hey, we've got a church that's absolutely packed, you feel it's quite good. And that's why sometimes God brings you down. I've been in meetings where there's been five or six people, and I'm thinking, what's the point of this? And they've turned out to be some of the best meetings I've ever been in because we measure things by the wrong standards. John came to be a witness to Jesus, and I hope that that's what we're trying to do here. I hope that ultimately, ultimately if you came here because you kind of liked the place or liked the people or liked the music or even thought I wasn't that bad, then you would, ultimately you would just, what's the point? But if you come to see and find who Jesus is, because that's all we've got, that's all that we can really offer you. In... Uh, at the opposite end of the scale of Apocalypse Now is Whoopi Goldsberg, Karina Karina, which is a lovely little film. Um, and it has this incredible wee girl who sings this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, look it up. She's singing to her grandmother from uh, Eastern Europe who's, who's lost her husband. And this, this wee girl sings it, and then of course you get the full black gospel choir going and belting it away, and it's, and it's wonderful. It's actually a very moving uh, piece of film. But that's what we think sometimes. We think, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Or people say, the light within. Let the light within. You can go to lots of places. I can take you to places just along here where they will say, now you need to find your light within. And I'm saying, uh-uh, the light within is darkness. I need the light that comes from Christ. I can't look within myself to find light. So, then we look at the true light. And Liz, this is your last time. John 8, verse 12. Okay. John chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It's an incredible claim. I am the light of the world. Please don't just dismiss it. And even if you're a Christian, don't just think you understand it. What does it mean? So again, this idea of light utterly fascinates me that, that we need light to make things grow. So I came across um, this wee video, which we are going to show. And if they could show it just now, that would be great. To give you some idea.
very simple, but uh, if you were to watch the whole of that film, I think it's uh, a whole year just looking at, and obviously speed it up, about how light affects things and makes things grow. Incidentally, just a, a, a very simple question for me is, why are things beautiful? In a world which is entirely based on a, an evolutionary principle, that it's about survival. Well, why does a flower need to be beautiful? Is it to attract bees? Is it to scare away spiders? I mean, what's the reason? What, what, maybe I'm being a bit simple here, but what, what, if, what if it's just so that they can be beautiful? What if God created a world in which there could just be beauty? Why, why does everything have to have a purpose and a point? You know, what's the point of that painting? I don't know. It's just nice. Is there, is there anything wrong with that and the variety here, what's being said is that Jesus comes in the world as the light of the world now, and it says gives light to everyone. How does Jesus give light to everyone? So Augustine had an idea where he used this illustration of a town with only one teacher. Though not all the citizens are the teacher's students, he's nevertheless the teacher for everyone. So he's saying, look, there's one teacher. He's the teacher for the town. He's the teacher for everyone. So Christ is the only true light God has given to the whole world. But that, I hate to disagree with the great Augustine, but that's not really what it says. It says that he gives light. It's not just he's available for light, but he gives light. So what does that mean? It means that the very presence of Jesus in this world changed this world. It became a different place. Now, you can reject that light, you can close your eyes, you can walk away from the light, but you cannot extinguish the light, and it doesn't depend on you for its existence. In John's gospel, it's repeatedly said that the light shines upon all, whether we see it or not. There is a, a well-known English commentator, Russell Brand, who, um, he, he's just a remarkable character. At one and the same time, he's lewd and crude and disgusting and, and so many different things, and also brilliant and, and thoughtful and insightful. And my son sent me a clip of him after a particular controversy involving Manuel from Faulty Towers uh, and said, Dad, you've got to watch this. And, and it was an interview with Jeremy Paxman, and I said, I'm no, I have no interest in Russell Brand. Well, I watched it, and my son was right, and I was wrong, not for the first time. It was utterly brilliant. Look it up. Russell Brand being interviewed by Jeremy Paxman twice. And at one point in that, uh, Paxman asked him, do you believe in God? And Brand said, yes. And Paxman's really shocked. This amoral, sexually promiscuous, you know. And, and so he starts questioning him. And, pa and Brand, who's not short of words, he just, blah, 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 you know, just pours out. But at one point he said, he said some amazing stuff. But one was he said, I don't, I don't want all the stuff in this world. He said, the fame and the money and everything. He said, that's just shadows on the wall. He said, I want the source of light itself. I don't want the shadows. And I thought, wow. So that makes me think of uh, the true light. Oh, by the way, you can see that's, that's my bike, by the way. That's not why it's there, but that's uh, the pool. And you go down to Newcastle Pool. I love seeing the, the sunrise. Um, let's go on to the next one, please. Okay. This is Plato's great analogy, the cave. Um, and I just think this is one of the most wonderful things. It's called The Allergy of, of the Cave. It's worth going reading for yourself. Um, and it comes from one of his books, The Republic. And what it does is it imagines a group of people chained together inside an underground cave as prisoners. Behind the prisoners, there's a fire. And between the prisoners and the fire are moving puppets and real objects on a raised walkway with a low wall. But the prisoners can't see anything behind them. And because they've been in there forever, they, they, all they see is the shadows on the wall. However, they believe that all these things, these shadows, are real. Their visible world is their whole world. But Plato goes on to say, what would happen if one of them escaped? And he came out of the cave and he couldn't see because it was so bright. But as his eyes opened, he began to see real things. And then Plato asks, how would they adjust? Would they believe what they saw outside? Would they think that was the illusion? What would happen if they returned? And would they, what would they say to the prisoners? And 
The narrative assumes that the freed prisoner would return, try to liberate their fellow prisoners, because th these fellow prisoners don't know how much of the real world exists outside the cave, and Socrates goes on to, to say that the prisoners would kill the one who came back because they, didn't, they couldn't cope with the truth. It's a bit like if you've seen the film The Matrix, you know, you take the red pill or the blue pill and you know that one of them, I can't remember which one it is, but one of them takes you into a fantasy world where you have steak all the time and have a wonderful time and the other takes you into the real world where you're fighting machines who are trying to persuade you to take the other pill. Um, it, 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 it's a bit like that. Well, I think that we need to wake up to reality. I think, we are very, I think Plato was so right. I think so often we are living in the shadow lands. We're living in worlds of illusions. We don't see the reality. We can, we can get offered lots of different, how would we know what reality is? And that's this great thing about what we call meeting Jesus or getting to know who Christ is, that he is the ultimate reality. He is the light. He is the truth. Um, can we go on to the next one, please? Just um, the truth. The Cave is a song also by Mumford and Sons, who wrote it because of the, the uh, Plato, Plato tale. It's an incredibly insightful song from the, back, from the point of view of a backslidden Christian. But this line stuck with me. Let me at the truth that will refresh my broken mind. Let me at the truth that will refresh my broken mind. Jesus says, John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 12, 46, I have come into the world as, as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. I would say this, there is enormous darkness in this world. There's confusion. How do we know what's real? How do we know, not know what's real? If, if you've had a, a psychotic illness, um, I've been in hospital and had you know, was given drugs and all that kind of stuff and was seriously ill. And it's amazing what you believe when you're like that. I had grandiose things. You know, I thought I was being chased by Colonel Gaddafi and I was the king of Norway and oh, who else? It doesn't matter. It just, but you get, you, it's delusional. But you try and explain to someone who's delusional that they are delusional. You say to someone, no, there are no Russians under the bed. I said to one of the guys who was singing out there, you're not Elvis. Well, I am. I, I, am, I, am, I am Elvis if you really... You know, you, it's really hard to explain. And we may smile at those examples, but in reality, we find ourselves in a situation where, how do we know what's true? How do we know what's right? And for me, it's very simple. I come to Christ. And that's why uh, one of you asked last week if you could have Magnificent Obsession, and I gave it to you, so I've got another one. Um, it's a book I wrote about Jesus. If, if you're not a Christian and you would like to get it, please feel free. But I want to uh, leave you this with this quote before we sing, and then you've got time for some Q&A. Um, from a guy called Thomas Brooks, it says this, Jesus gives the light whereby his people are enabled to see sin to be the greatest evil and himself to be the chiefest good. He gives the light that melts the soul, that humbles the soul, that warms the soul, that quickens the soul, that quiets the soul, and that glads the soul. Brooks goes on to say that we're not born with a heavenly light like we're born with a tongue. We're not born with an inner light, but Christ needs to come and to light up our souls. And in a, another book in the Bible, in Ephesians 5 verse 8, it says, you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. You may not like to hear that. You may not don't want to hear that you were darkness. You don't want to even hear even more, you're dead in sins and trespasses. But just as you saw that photo of, or that film of what happens to flowers that bloom when the light the, and everything else comes in, when Christ's light begins to shine on you, when his light shines on you, you find that you come to life in different ways. But it is an absolutely amazing thing. And uh, we will look at some of that next week. Um, can we look at the last one, I think? I mentioned this because next week is Easter, and what we're going to do at this service uh, next week is look at not just the evidence for the resurrection, but what it actually means. So I'm, we'll, I'm, I'm putting there hot cross buns because I was hoping that's what we would have. Um, <laughs> by the way, there's a, is, is there a store called Iceland here? No. All right, there's a store in the UK called Iceland. I, think, I keep thinking this stuff is getting made up, but it's not. They've decided to remove the crosses from the hot cross buns and put ticks on them. Eh? Well, we'll have hot cross buns with crosses on them. And so I hope.
Um, that'll be next Sunday. Let's sing uh, a song that from the Bible, uh, which kind of talks about this stuff at one level. Uh, Psalm 43, because it talks about the despair and then pleading that God would send out his light. We'll sing this, think about any questions. We'll have a couple of minutes or so for questions after this, and then we'll have our final song. Um, but if anyone's got any, any questions or comments about any of that, I've got one anyway, but um, I'll, well, I'll start with the one. What about depression? I, I love the Psalms, that Psalm we just sang, because sometimes Christians give the impression that we're happy all the day, you know. Um, Obviously, not if you're a Scottish Presbyterian, but um, there are uh, other people who think, well, that's, it's not, aren't the Christians the shiny, happy people? No. Here's something that might, might not attract you to be a Christian. It's possible that if you become a Christian, you'll experience more pain, sorrow, and depression than if you didn't. And I'll tell you why. Because you can't shut your eyes to the reality. You can't anesthetize yourself with entertainment or drink or illusions. You have to face the reality, and the reality can sometimes be almost overwhelming. So he said, why are, you, why are you so downcast in me? Why are you so depressed? Please understand this. I, I, it, it, it is an incredibly sad thing when people talk about depression as though it was sinful. Now, in some instances, it may be caused by things that we do or that are sinful, but largely depression is nothing to do with that. You, you wouldn't say to someone, if they had a broken leg, well, that, that's because you're sinful. Well, someone might have a broken mind, and it's not because they're sinful. And the idea, well, you know, just cheer up. Uh, uh, and there's a darkness that can come over people. And I would hope that in a church, people would come in here and be free to express or to think even their dark thoughts. In fact, I think it would be very off-putting to have to go into a church. I remember a woman coming in one time, a young uh, girl who's only 21, and I said, why do you come to the church? And she said, because you're the church that lets me be sad. And I said, well, that's a great advert. We'll stick it out on the notice board. Come to the church that lets you be sad. And she said, no, don't joke about it. She said, I suffer from depression. And one of the worst things that happens is when Christians either try to cast out demons or worse still, they try to cheer me up. There's a real darkness that can come over us, and I think we need to try and understand that a whole lot more. But ultimately, Jesus come, does come to dispel that darkness as he comes to heal sickness, but that doesn't mean that in this world that we're, when you become a Christian, you're just going to be happy all the time. You're not. And some of us experience that darkness, none more so than Christ, who on the cross cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Nobody has gone into more darkness than Christ psychologically and emotionally. His suffering, Mel Gibson got this right in The Passion of the Christ, his suffering wasn't just physical, it was emotional, it was spiritual, it was from the devil as well. So yeah, um, depression is part of the darkness that's within the world that Christ will ultimately list, lift, but I, I, I would beg you, please, do not assume that if you suffer from depression, you can't be a Christian. That doesn't, I'm reading a, The Life of William Cowper just now, who was, I guess you would call almost a manic depressive, and uh, row, out of that came the most extraordinary poetry and hymns, some of which we still sing. And he was a beautiful and lovely Christian, but at times it was so dark for him that he did want to commit suicide, and he did doubt enormously what God was and who, what God was doing. So... Um, does anyone want to ask anything else? Sorry, that was such a long answer, but such an important question. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is sin. I think the devil is the prince of darkness and the father of lies. Um, I think the answer to your question will be in two weeks' time, by the way, <laughs> because it talks about the, the people rejected this. You know, people reject. The, you think the light comes, they would accept it, but the people rejected it. There are just people who want to live in the darkness. 
You know, they prefer to live in the darkness. I've come across many people like that. Myself, I would have been like that too. Uh, and so I think that there's, it, it is, it, it's the cave. It's Plato's allegory of the cave that you're in and, and all you see is the shadows and you want to stick what you know. And actually the reality really terrifies you. You know, for me, heaven terrifies me. Eternity terrifies me. If I could just live in a wee world which was self-contained and I could understand all of that, even if it was a dark place, even if it was bad things in it, in a sense, that's much more attractive than having to go out into a world, into an ocean where I am not in control. And yet that's why the most important thing is for people to see the beauty of Christ. Because I don't understand lots of things, but I trust Christ. So I think, but the answer to your question, I'm not going to go any further into it because it, it will be in two weeks' time. Okay. I trust in his care.